Uh, can I have a quick show of hands? Who's heard of Tencent? Great start. Uh, one of China's biggest technology companies, one of the biggest online gaming companies in the world, and a social media giant that runs WeChat. But this man here, David Wallacey, the chief exploration officer of Tencent, has a bit of a different role. Uh, Tencent's a heavy investor in so many different areas. Uh, and David, let's kick off the conversation. And what exactly is a chief exploration officer? What do you do at Tencent? Well, thank you for asking. Uh it's my 23rd year now in Tencent. So for the first years, I had a more normal sounding title. But about eight years ago, I was spending so much time worrying about global challenges on one hand and investing in next generation technologies on the other that I thought, OK, I need a, a cool title or something fun <laughs> right. to kind of suggest that that's actually what I'm doing all the time. And so we came up with the title Chief Exploration Officer. And, and really, it's a, it's a role that often involves uh, investing, like many venture capitalists do. But right. There, as part of the role, there's a lot of thinking about trends, like what is happening in the world and trying to make sure we're targeting the right trends with next generation technology. And then part of that thesis is also thinking about and what you've written about is existential global challenges yeah. facing humanity. Yes. Uh, what are they? Well, Don't scare us too much. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, here at Davos, there's a lot of discussion about climate change. And that's really important. Um, I think about the causes of climate change, as we are all discussing about, but also the, the, the risks that we have. And uh, actually, last year, we released a book in China called um, Rearchitecting Earth, Artificial Intelligence for Food, Energy, and Water. Right. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the nexus between the needs of global agriculture, energy, and water, and how with climate change, we actually face more and more risks with productivity of, of, of agriculture, water availability, and also energy availability because you've got hydropower issues and other issues, right, that will stress energy. So we think about that, and then the book was really about how you can use artificial intelligence to make those areas more resilient and reduce our existential risks there. Great. Could you just uh, help us understand the, your, your uh, strategy for investing? Because, again, Tencent, we know it's invested in, in yeah. so many different companies. When it comes to gaming, it often acquires or takes stakes in gaming studios, and that complements Tencent's gaming strategy. But when it comes to the areas you're investing in, is it about str that strategic fit, or is it really just about yeah. you know, good returns? Well, we want to have good returns. And I feel like you should be making great returns when you're solving the most important problems on Earth. Right. The, solving those most important problems should bring back the highest ROI inherently. Um, first of all, all of my investing, I think, for my entire career at Tencent has always been outside of China. And we've been investing outside of China since 2007. Right. So that's a long time now. Um, we typically invest like a VC. We take minority positions under 20% and sometimes much less than that to support great entrepreneurs great technologies, and really, you know, we want to bring these technologies back to China when possible, but the first and foremost objective is just supporting that entrepreneur and that team to make this technology a reality. Let's say we back a company that's doing a cancer diagnostic. Roughly half of our investing is actually in next generation healthcare. Right. We, want to, we want to solve cancer with this company. It's not only about the ROI. Of course we want ROI, but you know, there is a value to actually getting rid of cancer. And I tend to really focus all of our investments on that priority, getting rid of the problem. And when you do that, you're going to have spectacular returns. And we've had great returns in this kind of space already. Yeah, and let's, let's take a, a section of what you said in terms of uh, some of the big existential threats, climate change. Uh, one of the sort of thematics in some of the investments Tencent's made is around mobility, next generation mobility, electric mobility, uh, and what that looks like. Um, EVs, electric vehicles, are an area that Tencent has investments in, in NEO, but also in Tesla, which perhaps is more well known uh, to our audience here. Um, you initially helped lead that investment. Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, we worked on that. 2016 or so? Our, yeah, our executive team. Uh, yeah, what was the, what was the well, thing behind the early? Yeah, at so that, point, that, quite that early. was a time when um, actually you know, Tesla has come a long way since then. They were, if you can remember, they had a lot of problems with short sellers and yeah. they actually made shorts. Yeah. You know, because yeah, I think Elon I, was yeah. being for them. It was a time when it wasn't so clear yeah. that they were going to survive and that EVs were going to actually survive because Tesla has been leading the way on that. Yeah. We saw uh, a huge potential in the company, the category of EVs, but also a huge amount of respect for the way Elon was driving the company. Yeah. And we found that we, we, we actually took it upon ourselves to reach out and contact uh, Tesla and Elon saying, I think we could maybe work with you and support you. Um, it, it was, you know, we were very proactive there because we saw the way they were struggling and we wanted this category to win. So we ended up in investing, let's say, roughly 5%. and It was about roughly $2 billion. Mm. I think this is all in the media back then. And, uh, you know, that, that was at a time probably the market cap was 30, 40 billion. So, you know, that was when, when you get things right in the category, 
um, even though it's new and it's very risky, yeah. um, you can win really big. And Tesla certainly has become a market leader. It's huge share in China now and, and around the world. Um, are you, though, however, at this point, currently concerned about the direction for Tesla, given Elon Musk's distractions over at Twitter? Well, I think, you know, that's a tricky question, but you can always do more. You can always do better. Certainly, you know, if a leader's getting, like, distracted across many companies, uh, you know, it's hard to focus, and Elon has a lot of projects. I think they're doing, uh, they're still doing great work, and I think it's pretty, this is what we all wanted to see happen. We wanted to see a transformation yeah. to resilient mobility. You know, of course, there's going to be many competitors, and some of them are going to have awesome electrification, you know, spins and technologies that, that maybe Tesla's not doing, and that's entirely uh, normal. So I think overall, this competition and, you know, the new entrants coming in is going to be really good for the planet. And, yeah. you know, now I think EVs are roughly 10% of automobile sales. It's still a very small proportion. Yeah. Maybe Tesla's 1% to 2% of total uh, automobile sales, about 100 million cars a year, you know, 1% to 2 million, something like that. You mean um, currently or in the future? I, that's my understanding of the data. I think Tesla's yeah. right around there, 1% to 2 yeah. million sales a year, something, you know, so the whole category is maybe 10 million cars out of 100 million cars. We need to move that that number up dramatically, and it's hard for any one company to of course. solve the demand on their own. But um, I would count on them to keep blowing our minds with what they do with technology. I think they've got a good culture for Yeah, even, even as on. we see the, the, the current situation playing out with Elon Musk. And well, yeah, I, I'm sure they're gonna, they've got a lot of cool stuff up their sleeves. Cool. And in terms of um, where EVs go next then from the tech front, you know, yeah. we know they're selling cars and there's a lot of competitors out there and yeah. uh, they're all pushing the needle with designs. Yeah. But when it comes to technology, is it about autonomous driving? Is, hmm. is that, is that going to be key to solving any of these challenges, or is that just a fun thing to have? Yeah, I think, well, I, personally, I don't see autonomous driving as necessarily um, being a resilience technology mm. in itself, right? right? Um, but I think it is going to be a major game changer for safety, and not only just when you're hands off. I think uh, something that's really important is just the ability to, to, uh, mm. to have enhanced driving and have a safety envelope around the car. So, you know, the car has so many more sensors than your human brain does. It will help you see things from the side, from behind you, and stuff like that. And I think that's something that I'm very excited about is how, you know, autonomous driving can help with safety. So ho hopefully reducing mortality. I heard a case about a car in California a week or two ago, drove off a cliff, I think 150 feet, yeah. what, 50 meters or so here in Europe, right? And the whole family was fine basically, um, after that. So it's already a very safe design of a car, yeah. but with autonomous driving, I think it even becomes safer. So hopefully, you know, mortality uh, really gets reduced around the world um, from this new technology. Can we talk about something a little bit more sci-fi, flying okay. cars? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've been as, hoping as to talk about... call them. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, electric uh, mobility, yeah. but in the air. Uh, interesting company you invested in, Lilium. Yeah. Um, a German firm, right? German, yeah, based um, out of Munich. Yeah, no, I've, I've recently seen their, their uh, sort of vehicle yeah. um, in action last year where they're testing, I think, in Spain. Okay, um, oh, that's was, great. It was fascinating. Um, <laughs> but what's the thought process behind th yeah. this investment in Lilium? Um, yeah. And what's the potential, do you think, of, of the company and, and yeah. the sector? So we've been, uh, probably many people, when you think about Tencent, you may not know uh, to what extent we actually invest in all kinds of new ideas and industries. Yeah. Um, we start, we've been supporting... Next generation aviation, electric aviation, since 2017. Right. So this is quite some time now, and, and really starting with Lilium. And what's so fascinating about this new technology called eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing technologies, is that it's a total game changer. And it's a paradigm shift in the same way that the internet was a paradigm shift. And we've had, uh, you know, I sometimes talk about how we went from the carriage to the Model T about 100 years ago. And there was a point where the two cost the same amount of money. Yeah. You had to decide, do I buy a horse or do I buy a car? And actually, the fuel costs are the same. The hay is, was the same cost as the, the, the oil or the gas. I mean, it's just amazing. That was 100 years ago, but people, they obviously went to cars. Yeah. Now we have this new technology coming. It's so exciting because um, it's a plane, but you can take off vertically yeah. and land vertically. The, the mission range is about 175 kilometers. What I love about it is um, check it out online because it's obviously like really cool. But when you can start having options that that allow you to reduce your investment for transportation. You may not need to have so many bridges, tunnels, and roads going forward. This is a CapEx game changer. This is a climate game changer, also from the road infrastructure perspective, because this is a trillion dollars a year in global investment going towards road infrastructure. Yeah. And we have to have some tools to reduce that, but our populations are growing, people don't like traffic, so the tendency is just keep building more and more roads, yeah. more concrete, more electricity, steel. If we actually use the air as our infrastructure, yep. 
and just you know, clean energy and batteries, it's a total game changer. Plus, you get to your destination faster than anything else, and yeah. it's really fun to fly. So I think this is something that will be changing the world, and it's not too far away. I want to ask about the path to how we get there, to this yeah, mass market. Sure. But I want to ask the audience something quickly. Who would feel safe in a, uh, one of these flying electric vehicles that didn't have a pilot inside there? Who would feel safe? Barely anyone. Okay, well, the right. good news so, is... So I just wanted yeah. to address that. Yeah. How, how big a challenge is that consumer acceptance, yeah. that safety aspects, and the perception of this kind of vehicle? So the uh, planes, first of all, will be piloted. So you don't they have to worry about walking into a plane without yeah. a pilot. <laughs> Six passengers, one pilot. So okay. that's good news. Um, that's a new addition. Also, it? the standard to which... So everything is regulated by EASA. Yeah. It's a German company, so it's regulated by the airport... The, the, um, Aviation Authority called the IASA, mm. okay? Um, it's built to a standard called 10 to the minus 9, one incident every billion hours. This is the exact same standard as all commercial aviation. If you go into an Airbus 320, actually the CEO of Lilium yeah. is the uh, former lead of the Airbus 320 program. So yeah. he built many Airbuses, about you know, hundreds and hundreds a year for many years. Um, it is the exact same standard. It has to be as safe as that. And typically when we go into an Airbus 320 or whatever kind of a Boeing plane, we expect it to be safe. It is the exact same standard. Helicopters use a different standard. That's usually 10 to the minus seven, one out of every 10 million incidences. So it's very important when you get in one of those planes to ask, is this certified by IASA? I mean, that's the only way you're gonna get into it, by the way. <laughs> and is it at this high standard? Because that is what drives the safety. Yeah. But of course, you need to see these things fly, and they need to be flying, and then people will feel safe. Exactly. So it's, yeah. about, it's about that perception change, right? Yeah. It's about people understanding the safety, the technology behind it, et cetera. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, in the 1990s, I did yeah. a project to actually make sure that electromagnetic radiation would be safe from mobile phones. There was right. a time uh, 25 years ago where you thought maybe you'd get brain damage yeah. holding a phone up to your head. It's a very powerful device. But now you see everyone using mobile phones and things like that. We don't worry about it so much. Um, yeah. I think this will be similar. People haven't even seen this before their own eyes yet. I think when you see it and you see it flying safely, people will be like, oh, I could get in the traffic or I could try that and get yeah. to my destination. No, it does look very cool. Hours. It does look very cool. I wanted to ask a little bit about because you mentioned and infrastructure and roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for you know these these vertical uh, takeoff uh, landing yeah. vehicles, what is the infrastructure required for yeah. that? Is it these sort of like mini helipad sort of things? Exactly. Or? Yeah. I mean, and you could have a really cool helipad, maybe right. something here in Davos, or you could have something really simple and low cost. Yeah. And so you need a landing place. Think of yeah. it basically as the same kind of size as a helicopter. So we've seen those before. Right. Um, you need electric charging, think of Tesla. Yep. Uh, maybe the thing's a little more bulkier because you're uh, having about the equivalent of three Tesla battery packs yep. to drive the plane. So it's, you know, it's gonna charge a little more energy in there. Yep. Um, and, uh, and that's it. You, know, you, you get in the plane, you fly it, and then you land in another landing pad. And I love it because your energy can actually be decentralized. You could have solar panels or wind on top of a mountain right. with maybe a little backup battery, and you could land somewhere and charge that plane and then fly to your next destination. And is the goal to have these things in built up cities like New York yeah. or London or something like that? Or is it more about sort of figuring out? Yeah. The, you know, there's a lot of debate because, you know, you look at a city like uh, New York or London, lots of buildings, high rises, people, whatever. You know, when you try to envisage this and you think, well, this, this could be unsafe or this just might not work from an yeah. infrastructure perspective. So where, where, what's the actual thinking? How does this get to the mass adoption? And what's your view on yeah. what it'll eventually look like? Yeah, when you see all these cars driving and all these bikes going in between them and people are like, oh, that's really safe. But yeah. then if you have a plane landing on top of a building, yeah. you're like, it seems so dangerous, though. But you've yeah. got like a million cars driving and accidents happening every five seconds around a city. It's a little bit ironic to me. Um, but the, this plane has been entirely optimized to land in the middle of a city. So the idea from the design of the very beginning is like, you should be able to fly, but you don't have to drive the hour, hour and a half you live in like London or New York yeah. to get to the airport. You should be able to go right from downtown and then fly to another city, right to the downtown of that city. Now, how is that possible? Because the propellers are actually ducted fans. They're not exposed propellers. They're in ducts, yep. like jets, mm. and that allows you to encase them and make them very quiet. <clears throat> Right, so, so you can fly, um, you know, Lillian uses these small jets that are yeah. about 30, and you can land in the middle of a city and take off very quietly, no emissions, of course. Yeah. And I've, we've, we made some simulations of this using the Unreal Engine. You could actually see if we're moving like, you know, tens of thousands of people a day through a city like New York, what does it look like watching the plane land, take off again? And the simulation is so boring. No one wants to watch yeah. it. It's probably why you never saw it, because nothing's happening. Yeah. It, like every 30 seconds, a plane comes in, then, you know, and then it leaves, and it's like, 
well, I thought this was going to change my life. It's kind of boring, and that's the whole point. It's yep. not really a big deal. Meanwhile, on the you know the simulation, the city has all the bikers, all the honking of the horns and stuff like that. And you're like, um, that's not a big deal. David, that's a wonderful insight into what you do at Tencent, uh, where you're investing, and some of the future tech we can definitely uh, learn to get excited about. Thank you so much for your Thank time you for today, David Wallerstein, yeah. Chief okay. Exploration Officer of Tencent. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Davos. <laughs> Thank you.